Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Gordon Shotwell. I'm a data scientist at a company called SoCure. We do fraud uh, prevention. And I'm going to talk to you about Quarto and Jupyter. Um, how many of you are Jupyter users? Yeah? OK. Um, so this is a website you could follow at quarto.shotwellca if you are interested. Um, so I, a lot of my work is running a shared data science server, and SoCure has grown like crazy over the last three years, so it's been, it went from something like 20 users to more like 100, and over the, and it's, it's kind of like ballpark the editors that people use on the server. So a lot of Jupyter users, some VS Code people, and some RStudio people. But what I noticed is that all of my headaches come from the Jupyter users. Every time there's a problem, every time something breaks or something can't be launched, I just go, Jupiter, just every time, Jupiter. And I started asking, like, why is this? Like, why, why does this editor cause me personally so much problem, so many problems? Not that I use it, I don't really, I'm not a Jupiter user, but other people break my server um, using this tool. Um, and I think the key problem is that Jupiter uses like a fundamentally different um, development pattern than other computer science tools. And this causes a lot of problems when you try to integrate it with any of these other computer science tools. So a lot of the tooling around programming is built around a different paradigm than Jupyter. Um, and the way I put this is that um, they differentiate between the editorial environment and the execution environment. There's like usually a clear bright line between the times when you're editing something and the times when you're running something. But Jupyter blends those two together and that's really part of the design of the software. It's supposed to be like an interactive uh, notebook environment that lets you kind of like play with your data and move back and forth. But it causes a lot of problems. So some of these problems are um, because you're kind of like the user is also executing the data. They might do that kind of out of order, and that state can become very complex. It can become difficult to reason about or record. Um, the code itself can cause sort of deep, profound problems to your editor. So you might like run something weird, do some sort of odd memory thing, and then suddenly like just Jupyter doesn't work for a long time, and you don't know why. It's very hard to figure it out. So it's not just like something crashing, but something kind of deeper happening to the software. Um, and then integrations with other computer systems can be difficult. In particular, Git can be difficult. So this is um, the kind of uh, JSON that a Jupyter notebook is stored. So when you just like naively try to like go check in um, a Jupyter notebook to Git, you try to like use any of the systems that kind of rely on Git as GitHub or something as an input, you kind of end up with this thing. And this is really easy to um, make mistakes with. So you can, for instance, like check uh, credentials into your Git repository. You can check in uh, PII that's not supposed to be in a Git repository just because it's this giant, unreadable JSON blob. It's very difficult to review. Um, so recently, I came across this wonderful blog post about how the Jupyter Git problem has been solved. And the thing that I kind of was thinking about when I was looking at this is that it just shouldn't take this long, right? It shouldn't, Git is a basic sort of thing that's existed for a long time. It works with almost everything. Like it shouldn't take, you know, like millions of dollars and 10 years of dedicated work to get the system to, to function on, on Git. So the way I'd sort of put this is that, um, like to kind of like break it out a little bit, put a little graph on it. Um, most programs use this kind of like write execute model. So you have, you know, you're writing your code and then you have this source code, which is kind of like a rigid, um, it determines what the outputs are going to be, right? So this kind of like executor goes and reads this source code, parses it, and then produces some outputs. This creates a, a lot of wonderful things because this actually is a useful data structure. It's this thing you can sort of track over time. It's something you can analyze to do static code analysis or something like that. Um, and this executor is kind of like, um, always does the same thing. Like there's no humans in this part. So you kind of have confidence that once you know what's happening here, you know what's gonna happen here in the outputs. Um, but Jupyter uh, uses what I would call like kind of like a rexecute model. It, you write the code and then that, that kind of creates this sort of like code output um, construct. And then when you're kind of like running the code or working through it, that's actually modifying the sort of code output structure. And there's ways that you can sort of like parse the code out of that. There's ways you can kind of parse the code out of it. But the tool itself kind of pushes users to have this kind of like 
highly unsteady interactive workflow. And I think that's one of the things I've observed about people who are very, very skilled and excellent data scientists, but because they kind of maybe learned to do this as the way that they work, they kind of have a little bit of a moat around moving to sort of like more general um, computer science workflows. So R actually had a different whole pattern to um, notebook development, which is these write execute notebooks. Um, so when you write a, an R markdown notebook, this is RMD style, um, you actually just write the sort of code and document and, and text together in a single document. And just like source code, that document is kind of is a rigid artifact, right? It's just text. There's no logic in the R markdown notebook. There's no um, state in the R markdown notebook. It's just text. And what the renderer does is take that note, that um, document, go find all the things that are labeled as code, pass that code through an interpreter, and then put the code and the text back together into these output formats, right? And this is a really wonderful pattern um, because um, like most of the things work um, right away, right? So there, there hasn't ever been like an R markdown Git parser, right? Because R markdown documents are just text, so they just work with Git, right? It's just like any other um, computer source code from when there were punch cards, right? It's a text that's then interpreted. Um, similarly, if you ever use like new make or any of those sort of like orchestration tools, they work really well with this code because um, that's kind of what they're expecting. They're expecting text that's then run through some kind of interpreter. Similarly, it's really, really easy to compose our Markdown notebooks with just, you could either copy and paste them together or parse them together in some other format. Um, it's easy to package libraries, and it's also really easy to mix languages. So you can, I think, use something like 17 different computer programming languages in an R Markdown document, and they'll all play well together because it just goes and finds the Python code, runs it through a Python interpreter, goes and finds the Scala code, runs it through a Scala interpreter, right? And these are all kind of well-solved problems um, in computer science. But there's three big problems. The first problem is that it starts with the letter R. Right, and so in, <laughs> it, I work with a lot of Python users, and um, you know, it's just it's their least favorite letter. They, if you if you propose any kind of tool or solution, and that solution starts with R or even has an R in it, they just say no. Um, uh, the second sort of maybe more real problem is that it requires an R runtime, right? So R is a very niche programming language. It's not sort of necessarily installed on everybody's laptop. You know, it's not installed on every server, so that can be difficult. Um, and the last one is that it um, has a slightly inconsistent user interface. So our Markdown is 10-year-old technology, and over time it's kind of been elaborated on to do a lot of different things. So like people write their blogs in it, or my blog in our Markdown. Um, this, you know, you could write presentations in our Markdown, books, you know, and then also just kind of data science reports. And over time it's to accommodate all of those use cases, kind of started adding different options, and those options started drifting in terms of how consistent they were. Um, so this is where Cordo comes in. Um, Cordo is a new project from our studio. Um, and the main um, feature of it is that it's a, a fully language agnostic version of our markdown. So it's a TypeScript command line utility. It doesn't have any um, R or Python dependency. You can use it for just R. You can use it for R and Python or Observable or JavaScript um, or Julia. Um, it also has a lot better branding, um, just because, so I've, speaking personally, I've had at work many, many times where I've just seen people waste like huge amounts of money on things that really could have been a scheduled R Markdown document, right? And I have not been able to convince a single one of them to use a scheduled R Markdown document to solve their problem. But every one of them, as soon as I talk about Cordo, they're really excited about Cordo because the, the, the capabilities that it has and how simple it is are really powerful. But it doesn't start with the letter R, so it kind of like gets through the gate. Um, and then lastly, it's got a unified um, extensible in, in, uh, interface. So it's kind of the interface is, is focused a little bit more on Pandoc, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and so that means that it kind of like it's a lot, lot more consistent and easier to work with. Um, so how does this work? So you write a QMD document, which looks a lot like an RMD document, if you've ever been familiar with, if you're familiar with that. So it's Markdown with sort of specific code chunks. Um, and then when you render that document, Cordo goes and does, passes the code through an executor, or through, a, through an interpreter, um, and then puts together this uh, Markdown document, which is so the, the output of the code is turned into Markdown, um, and the text is parsed, is, is 
put where the text goes, just as Markdown. Um, and this goes to a system called Pandoc. And Pandoc is this uh, really incredible uh, uh, tool for turning documents into other documents. So, um, so, it, so it has basically uh, what's called a, like an abstract, abstract syntax tree on top of documents. So it says like, you know, for a PDF, this part of a PDF kind of maps on to this abstract syntax tree, which then maps down to a Word document or a PowerPoint document or something like that. So with Pandoc, you can take this Markdown file and render it into you know lots and lots and lots of different formats. So this present, this slideshow is done that way. Um, you can do HTML, of course, websites, books, all these kind, types of different things. Um, this is what the code format looks like if you're totally unfamiliar with it. So it's a little, so this is just something you can write in a text editor. Um, and basically the sort of two things, so most of this is markdown uh, notation, so those are like headings. Um, and then you have these little back ticks that define like inline code, so this would be like an inline code chunk. And then you could have uh, code chunks that sort of um, specify the language here and then you can just run code. So what Cordo does is it goes and it finds anything like this, passes it through the interpreter that's labeled by this thing, and then produces the output. So in this case, that would produce an output that looks like this, right? Does the calculation of the two, puts out the, the, the text, it's like that. Um, so the main sort of uh, advantages of this is that it moves you from this kind of like fuzzy place where you're not really sure what your source code is, like how is it the sort of document you've produced, or is it the one where you produced and then ran some chunks? Instead, you have this sort of clear idea of like the QMD file that you're working with. That's the source code, right? So that's the thing that you can check into Git, you can share with people, you can test more easily, you can analyze more easily. Um, it gives you all the benefits of, of Pandoc, so you can render really beautiful um, sort of full-featured PDFs. You know, there's lots of different academic journal formats, things like that. Um, great caching, and you can compose notebooks together. So you can have lots of notebooks together that make a website. If you want to look at a website like that, you can look at my website. Um, but uh, you don't actually need to abandon Jupyter to start using this. So you can still use Jupyter as your um, main editorial environment, uh, because uh, Cordo can um, render Jupyter notebooks without altercation. And uh, preview them, and then all, you can also convert really easily back and forth between a Jupyter format and a Cordo format. Um, so you kind of don't need to actually change much about your work. Um, and then one thing that I would recommend is this um, NB Dev, which is by the uh, Jeremy Coward, who does Fast AI. Um, he kind of uses Cordo as basically the like publication layer on top of that kind of like notebook development um, pattern. Um, so the way to get started, uh, you can go to quarter.org. Uh, it's also included with the um, latest release of our studio, so just you don't need to, need to install anything. Um, their studio visual editor is really wonderful, whether or not you're an R user. It's, it's, got a, it's a really great um, visual markdown editor, which kind of uh, lets you sort of use these things really well. There's a VS Code extension that's also really good. Um, and so the main sort of rules here, is that your what you should try to do is store the code asset as a QMD document. Um, so that's something where it's like if you're working with Jupyter notebooks, you know, great, work with it. And then you want to at some point like write and check in like this text file that's like just the the document in the report. And when you share it, you should share it with that thing, and then probably some kind of like environment definition, like a if you use Conda or virtual env or something like that. Um, and the thing that you share with uh, people who want to read the code, who like, aren't like, going to go like, execute and work on the code, but just want to read the report, is the render document, which can include both the like, code that you use to do it, as well as the sort of like, prettily formatted output. Um, yeah, and that's what I've got. Uh, so you can contact me at my website or tweet me at Jishadwell. <laughs>